We've chosen a big subject tonight. It's going to take just a little time. I have a manuscript that has a lot more in it than I'll be uh, giving uh, verbally tonight. And those can be secured. Uh, so a lot of the material that I would like for you both to have at your hands will be in that manuscript. The reason I put a lot of uh, research into the writings of various scholars was uh, that you might have it in your hand. As I go about from church to church, I find most pastors don't have one book dealing with the subject that we're uh, about tonight. Nothing on the text issue uh, to speak of at all. And so I've put in about 80, 90 uh, references that can be of help from a number of sources, and so I trust that might be of help to you. We're going to be dealing with the history of Bible families in the English Bible. And the reason for this is a lot of folks do not understand why we're where, we at, where we're at tonight at all. Uh, and uh, many preachers don't understand. I didn't understand. Uh, in my schooling, uh, they simply said, uh, uh, basically, uh, here, here is uh, some Bible families that didn't really explain it much. Uh, and I came out with a good, strong, West Cotthorpe view of things. Uh, and uh, it was not until uh, 20 years down the road that I began to look into it a little bit and found I hadn't got a good education at all. Uh, and uh, really, it was quite a prestigious place where I went. But nevertheless, I, I didn't get what I was after in this particular area. I would like tonight to deal with this uh, shortly with you. And first of all, might we look at the Word of God and see what God thinks of His Word Himself. Uh, in Psalms 138, verse 2, the Word of God says, I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for the truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Then again, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, the Bible says, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle, shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Matthew 24, verse 35, the Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And then again, in First Peter 1, 25, the word of God says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And then in Psalms 11989, God says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Right. Then in Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Right. Now I believe history would tell us that there was a very definite t attack upon the original autographs. Uh, we find that there has always been uh, an attack upon the Word of God. Satan assaulted to that from the very time that he sought to destroy uh, our first fathers by telling them to not uh, listen to the command of God in the Garden of Eden. We find that there has been an attack upon the Word of God. We find in Jeremiah chapter uh, 23 verse 30 that Satan has always had his false prophets. The Bible says there, uh, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. The New Testament indicates that there is a spirit of changing the word of God and doctrinal matters. Uh, and this was from the very time it was uh, begun, from the very time of its inception in writing. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, the word of God says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with vain words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now the long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Many in Paul's day, we're corrupting the word of God. In fact, Paul even uses that word in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. And then in Galatians 1, 6 and 7, we have a notable instance also from Paul, I marvel that ye are so soon removed uh, from him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert or pervert the gospel of Christ. And so we find that history indicates, uh, not only as the word of God has indicated, uh, history also indicates that there have been changes in the text, and these certainly were true from uh, year 100, certainly up to year 200. 
up until possibly the time uh, that the canon was brought together. One of the scholars makes this statement, I will not quote them all, uh, very much tonight, uh, you can read them for yourself. But Scribner says, it is no less true to the fact than paradoxical in sound uh, that the worst corruptions to which the New Testament has ever been subjected originated within a hundred years after it was composed. That Irenaeus and the African fathers and the whole Western and with a portion of the Syrian church used far inferior manuscripts to those employed by Seneca, Erasmus, or Stephen 13 centuries later when molding the Tectus Receptus. Now this is quite interesting when you stop and think about it. Uh, and yet we find uh, Jack Mormon, one of our missionaries in England, makes the statement also concerning this whole matter. Uh, he says, when it comes to the earliest of the nearly 100 extent uh, papyrus fragment, fragments, diligent research has confirmed that corruption is the rule and not the exception. Uh, concerning P47, one of our uh, scholars, he's certainly not one of our kind, he's a liberal, uh, Kurt Allen, uh, who is involved with the Nessels uh, group today, uh, this man makes a statement that's quite uh, interesting. He says, we need not mention the fact that the oldest manuscript does not always necessarily have the best text. I wonder what Hort and Wiscott would do with him today. Uh, P47 uh, has this to say, he says, uh, he says, it is, by example, far the oldest of the manuscripts containing the full or almost full text of the Apocalypse, but it is certainly not the best. And so here they laud the oldest, and here one of their own says, this text is not the best. Uh, we note, uh, as we think of all of this, the question might come to some, who are or who were the heretics uh, that changed the text before year 200? Well, I believe they were the Gnostic Docetists that looked upon our Lord Jesus Christ as less than God. Now, these were the people that altered the New Testament, a text along with Christian scholars of the neo platonic philosophy which found lodging in the school of Alexandria. It's well documented that the first heretics who systematically depraved the New Testament were the Basil in year 134, Valentinus, 140, Marcion in 150, these three altered primarily the Gospels. They injected into the Gospels whatever additional material they wished. We find uh, certainly Bible families came out of all of this background. We start with the autographs. Men alter, change, corrupt. Uh, certainly those autographs, uh, those first the writings, uh, and these begin to form families. And we uh, have the various names by the scholars and I will not try to give you all of those. They have different categories for them. I would like to simplify it tonight and simply say, basically, uh, that we have the Alexandrian that we're concerned with uh, in our translation work, uh, and we say it's not to be utilized, uh, and then the traditional which we have backing our King James Bible that we feel should be utilized, and then, of course, the Western, and it's not nearly as much of concern to me tonight and to you on this matter as the other two. Now all of these uh, go back into antiquity. And the question might come, how then do we come by uh, these uh, three today? I would like to deal with first the Alexander in just a little bit, give you a, a little history. I believe that this family of Bibles is the result of an attack on the original, a text of the New Testament. The evidence we have already given, and you'll find in the paper, uh, fits the mindset of the leaders of the Alexandrian school. And since when the school was started, they could not do much with the text or change it a great deal. At that time on, they simply fostered what had already been changed. Then we find the text goes back to the days of Plymouth, uh, year 200. The Alexandrian text was solidified by those men uh, who founded the school there at Alexandria. Uh, he brought the wisdom of the world into the teachings of the Christian faith and began to collect a collection of corrupt manuscripts. The best known graduate of that school was uh, Origen, who followed Clement as the head of the school. Uh, this man was very influential. Uh, he was an allegorizer. He did not believe that Jesus Christ was a created being. He held much to what our Jehovah's Witnesses hold to today. Uh, he created a, a, a six-column um, uh, a, 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 a six Bible, uh, where he had various uh, versions of the Bible. Uh, this man uh, changed the Bible as he saw fit to fit his uh, liberal views of the day. 
Uh, if he could have had his way, and there are statements that he could not do all that he would like to have done, but if he could have had his way, he would have really chopped our Bible to pieces, I believe. The Alexandrian family came out of a background that denied literal interpretation of Scripture and allegorized Scripture to a place that was not recognized as such. This low view of Scripture allowed other serious liberties, as history indicates. The traditional family, I believe, is a preservation of the autographs. It has come down to us through ancient versions, such as the Peshitta, uh, which was translated, I believe, around 145 or 150 A.D., uh, the Gothic in 330 uh, A.D. and others. Also, the finding of the Papal versions, which uh, there are many uh, traditional readings of these oldest manuscripts. Early church fathers also witnessed to the traditional text. Wait, Dr. Wait, right here tonight, quoting Burgon says, uh, for the 76 church fathers examined, uh, fathers that died before A.D. 400, there were 2,630 references to the traditional text and only 1,753 to the Neologian or the Westcott Hort or the Alexandrian type text. Uh, the traditional text was definitely in existence well before 400 A.D. Uh, in other words, not only is the traditional text that backs our King James present in these church fathers' time, who lived and died prior to 400, the traditional text predominated over these texts also. Uh, we look at that T.H.L. Parker, uh, in uh, Calvin's New Testament commentaries make this statement, the churches of the Great Reformation deliberately adopted this ancient text when they took the Greek text as a starting point again. Uh, good question, why? I, I think uh, another big question would be uh, along this line, why would a seminary professor like Martin Luther uh, change from his Alexandrian text to the traditional text? Uh, that's an interesting question for us to think about tonight. And I pose this question to many along the way. Why would this man who used this, and if it was the best, and he thought it was the best, why in the world would he go to an inferior text? Uh, and why would all of the reformers do this? They all went to the traditional and left that which uh, was within the Catholic uh, backgrounds from out of which they came. Now, how did this text become the source of the new versions? Well, let's look at the history for just a moment uh, of the Bible text, and we'll see that the Alexandrian family uh, came to be the approved text for the new versions uh, through the efforts of two men, Westcott and Hort. Uh, it's very evident that Bible-believing people from the earliest days rejected the Alexandrian text. William Brady has said these overrated ancient authorities actually owe their natural survival to a continuous abandonment of God's people. Uh, that such is the case can easily be proven by observing both their individual depravities as well as their collective disagreements. And then further, the early church rejected the uh, Alexandrian text. The only adherent was the growing Roman Catholic acceptance of it. The Bible-believing people continued to use the traditional text. History will vindicate what I said if you read history. One of our great uh, Baptist leaders, uh, J. Frank Norris, made a statement, along with theology, the greatest need of the preacher is history. And gentlemen, may I say this tonight, most of us do not like history. Uh, most of us don't want to study history. Uh, and it's something that is vital to us in this particular field. Amen. Now let's look at the evidence for the early use of the traditional text. Uh, we have a number of versions that show evidence of the early use of the traditional text. Westcott and Hort attempted to rewrite history uh, and get away from the early date that we've already mentioned. Now, we do not find history supporting those two men, and I'll deal with that a little bit later. The Peshitta Syriac was transmitted, as I said, about uh, 145, 150 A.D., the Italic version about 157 A.D., uh, these, uh, this Latin Bible was the Bible of the Waldenses of northern Italy. And the churches of this group date back to the year 120. Dr. Alex, an outstanding scholar, says the enemies had corrupted many manuscri manuscripts while that of the Italic uh, church handed them down in their apostolic purity. Kenyon says that the Italic Latin Bible was translated from the received Greek text. That's an interesting statement. Uh, and he's not exactly from our uh, school of thought, and that the Latin Vulgate of Jerome is the Italian with the readings of the received text removed. 
Well, that should cause a lot of folk to change their views if they had just uh, read uh, that little bit of history. Uh, then also we note, uh, if you want to follow manuscript B, which is an interesting one in Luke, uh, you'll find there the last chapter has just been chopped all to pieces by that manuscript, but it's quite interesting uh, that those who go into the new versions uh, follow B and just leave Vaticanus even, which is almost unheard of with the West Scott Hort people. Uh, they leave uh, all of those old unisiles uh, there in the background, uh, and they follow D, uh, and it's strange to me that this version which we know, Marcion, just absolutely uh, uh, tore to pieces. This is historical fact as well. And why conservatives would align themselves with NASB when this is the case and only one manuscript supports uh, this uh, terrible uh, cutting up of Luke in the last chapter. Amen. Now we find the oldest manuscript, a uh, papyrus old, uh, manuscript in the world, is P66. Yeah. And it's predominantly KJV readings. Mm -hmm. Interesting too. Now we note uh, there's a grand deception, as I mentioned a while ago, on the part of Westcott and Hort. They had to get rid of this early, early day four, the traditional text. Uh, so they had to rewrite some history. History did not support them even in their day. Today, far, far less with the Patry documents out there. I don't think West Cahort would have got off the ground if those things had been found back in their day, but they came later, uh, and they should cause all of us to wake up and our comrades who say they're fundamentalists today. Right. Uh, we find the grand deception is this. Uh, certainly the Bible believing church had always held to the traditional text 1,700 years at least. And in 1881, the West Cohort people uh, undertook to change uh, all of this. The lay people in the churches did not follow the new versions of that day. They did not follow uh, the New American Standard or the New English uh, Bible of that day. The scholars, however, fell for West Cotton Hort, hook, line, and sinker. And we believe the increasing body of evidence in the church, the traditional text over this West Cotton Hort text for us today. Uh, we presented some evidence already for that, uh, of early tampering uh, of the text, and the fact that our text was back there. This same evidence caused Hort, especially Hort, uh, to fabricate a history that allowed for the Alexandrian family of text to be accepted as much older uh, than the traditional. This was necessary to sell his new Greek text. Uh, this fabricated history is called the Syrian Reclension or the Lucian Reclension. Now, the question for us tonight, does it have any validity? Uh, no, I don't think it has one ounce of validity. Right, right. It doesn't have a smidgen of validity. Right. Uh, West Cotton Hort with her followers argued uh, with uh, that the Byzantine uh, textual tradition, which includes the TR, did not originate before the mid-fourth century, and that it was a result of the conflation of earlier texts. Uh, they said it came as a result of uh, men getting together and taking what they wanted from the Western and from the Alexander and building this uh, a, a longer text uh, and pushing it off as Tectus Receptus there uh, in the late fourth century. Well, uh, certainly that's not the case, I, I don't think. Uh, we find that Westcott and Hort admit uh, that the Antiochian text uh, represented, uh, uh, was found early in some cases, and yet uh, then they turn around and say, we can't, uh, we can't buy that, uh, and they make it fourth century uh, to manufacture their position and make it uh, feasible for uh, their particular, uh, 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 particular uh, version. Now we note also uh, that Westcott and Hort theorized that such a prevailing text type could only be accounted for on the basis of its having been ecclesiastically uh, accounted for or uh, backed uh, as an ecclesiastical version or sanctioned without a, without a single shred of evidence. Uh, we find they uh, put this thing forth and they said a supposed wide, worldwide uh, church council was called and uh, these men simply picked out a good place, Antioch, a uh, good time, uh, 250 or 350, uh, a, a man by the name of Lucian as a coordinator, uh, and an outstanding, impressive sounding technical designation, the Lucian or the Syrian Reclension. Well, can we accept that? Uh, no, I don't think so. 
Uh, they said, well, some way, somehow, you know, they didn't have quite, you know, the uh, ability to get things known in those days. Well, it seems odd to me. They, they certainly got uh, the Nicene Council known uh, at 325, right in the middle of all of that. Uh, and it seems to me they got everybody together that they wanted to get together. Uh, they, they got the business done they were there to do, and thank God they did. They made a grand statement on uh, the person of our Lord. Now, I believe the matter of the Bible was just as important, the matter of our text, the matter of the very Word of God, the written Word of the living God was just as important, and we find not one written historical evidence of such a retention. None. Well, uh, everybody around that takes the other view, uh, they'll write about it, they'll act as though it's actual fact, they'll uh, state that it's reality, uh, and dear friends, uh, if it's going to be reality, I want it to have something back there in history proving it to me. Amen. And I think we better just face uh, the historical fact that it's not there. And now, answer to this cotton horn. I believe the writings of the fathers, as we've already noted, destroy the validity of West Scott and Hort's Lucian Reclension. Their writings are full of New Testament quotations. They provide a valuable witness uh, to the prevailing text of the day, which was traditional. Uh, Hort said the text found in the mass of existing manuscripts does not date further back to the middle of the fourth century. Before that text was made up, other forms of the text were in bold, which may be termed respectively Neutral Western and Alexandria. Now, to answer his statement, the writings of Tertullian, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Origen, and others, uh, Clement uh, of Alexander even, uh, have supplied us with 30,147 scripture citations alone. And their quotations for the majority of the instances agree with our traditional text. Well, that's something we ought to take note of, I believe, tonight. Then we find, as we look a little bit further, uh, might we just jump ahead for a while and consider the King James Version that we're all uh, here tonight to support. Uh, since 1881, all of the new versions have used a Westcott Court type of text. Edwin Palmer, chief editor of the NIV, shows his bias when he makes the statement concerning uh, the KJV. He says, all, and he's referring to those who translated it, all they had to work with was a handful of copies of the Greek, new Test uh, Greek manuscripts of the New Testament books. These were very late copies dating from a thousand years after the New Testament was written. Many more Greek manuscripts have been preserved and were subsequently discovered. In fact, more than 5,000 of them. You know, he just walked into a real nasty little trap, it seems to me. Uh, I wonder if he's aware uh, of the fact that of these 5,000, that all but a fraction, and that's about 1%, agree with our position. Uh, they don't agree with him at all. They don't agree with his NIV, uh, not at all. Uh, and D.A. Carson, who certainly is not one of our strike, makes a statement that the textual basis of the TR is a small number of haphazardly collected and relatively late minuscule manuscripts. And the following is a statement from one of our fundamental institutions of higher learning, which supports these two fellows. Uh, and I quote, because the Alexandrian manuscripts are much older and closer to the time of the originals uh, were written, a careful comparison of these manuscripts with the Middle Ages has convinced us that a more accurate and careful job of copying was done by the Alexandrian scribes. First time they ever did that. And thirdly, Erasmus had to work in haste with limited resources. It is our conviction that these Alexandrian manuscripts, which were not known to Erasmus, are, as a rule, the more accurate manuscripts to follow. Therefore, along with a great majority of conservative scholars in house say, we believe that the state, the text of Westcott and Hort, based upon these Alexandrian manuscripts, is as a whole superior to the text upon uh, manuscripts of the Middle Ages. Now, how do we answer the above? Now, it's true, Erasmus did not have Alf and B in their hands. They didn't have those two documents in their hands. But I believe with all of my heart, and history proves the fact, and we, we know it proves the fact, because Erasmus wrote on the variants that are between those two manuscripts and our traditional text. He knew of the problems that existed between them. Uh, he knew uh, this because his published notes 
uh, on Matthew 6, 13, the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 19, 17 to 22, the rich young ruler, uh, Mark 16, 9 to 20, the last 12 verses of Mark, uh, Luke 2, 14, the angel's song, Luke 22, 43 to 44, the bloody sweat of Christ in John 7, 53 to 8, verse 11, the woman taken in adultery in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, 16, the mystery of godliness, or uh, the incarnation, he dealt with every one of those. So I know that he knew about them. And furthermore, uh, Dr. Reddy again, quoting uh, Wilkerson's article on which Bible uh, makes this statement, uh, the case with the Vaticanus, which is B, and Sinaiticus, which is Alpha, is no better. The problems presented by these two manuscripts were well known, not only to the translators of the King James, but also to Erasmus, we are told that the Old Testament portion of the Vaticanus had been printed since 1587. Uh, Wilkerson further makes the statement uh, that another author, if Erasmus had desired, he could have secured a transcript of this manuscript, Vaticanus. He had the kind of uh, influence with uh, the Roman Vatican, uh, with the Vatican of Rome, to get that if he wished. Uh, from all of this evidence, uh, well, in fact, he even had uh, contact with uh, one of the great uh, professors there uh, in Rome, Apollos Bombasius, uh, and, and sent him all the brilliant readings he wanted. So it is an error for men to say that he did not have this kind of material at his fingertips. He chose what he wished. He took what he wanted. And he utilized what he felt was the best to bring forth that which he brought forth in his Greek text. From all of this evidence, it's hard for me to understand how one uh, would side with the Westcott Horn position, really. Now, where are we today? And we'll try to sum up quickly. Most of our fundamental uh, and evangelical schools today use Westcott Hort text in the Greek departments. Only a few Bible colleges like uh, Heritage and a few others around the country uh, use the traditional text. This is surprising in the light of the liberalism, first of all, of Westcott and Hort, and the history that supports the traditional text. Uh, Westcott, I won't give you a lot, but uh, certainly this man was not our kind of man. I'm appalled when I read uh, those who say they're from the Middle trying to beef up these guys and support these fellows and try to make them from the Middle when they make statements like this. Westcott says evangelicals are dangerous and unsound. How do you like that, gentlemen? Uh, Hort refers to the fanaticism of bibliologers. He says, the pure Romish view seems to be nearer and more likely to lead to truth than the evangelical. Evangelicals seem to me perverted. There are, I fear, still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority, especially the authority of the Bible. It strains that fundamentalists would herald the virtues of men who are, in their own words, our enemies. And their view of the word of God is absolutely diabolically opposite to what I have and I believe what you have. Well, let's look a little further here uh, tonight. Uh, let's look for a moment at the liberalism on the part of some of the translators that we have on the current scene. Uh, Lewis Foster of the NKJV and NIV committees makes this statement, each person has his own beliefs. Uh, these are bound to influence his judgment to some degree. If a person claims to be entirely unbiased, he is either fooling himself or trying to fool others. Neither the ancient scribes nor the modern translator can make decisions without being influenced by their beliefs. The objectivity of man has its limitations, no matter how accomplished the individual may be. Uh, he has his blind spots and particular views, study the translators as well as their translations. Good idea. A change may be better understood by knowing the position of the translator. Another good statement. Whether they are based upon a shift in the theological beliefs of the translator. Another NIV editor, uh, Ronald Youngblood, says, It may be true at times that the NIV translators have been guilty of reading something into the text. Uh -huh. uh, the NIV concordance editor says, Translations do evidence the theological convictions of their translators. It's complex because of individuals who favor one Bible over another for theological reasons, and publishers who promote one version over another at least partly for economic reasons. They finally came to the truth of it, didn't they? Oh my, dollars and cents. Oh my, how that gets a hold of these people. I don't think it had these things around 
Uh, in my mind, if it was not for that one issue for the most part. Uh, D.A. Carson makes this statement. He's a new evangelical, but he says, some modern translations tend toward the heretical. I never thought he'd ever say that, but he did. By virtue of the force of the presuppositions that govern the translation. You get back to the traditional text, you don't have that problem. You don't have any problem there coming out of heresy by translating that text. You don't do that. And then, did you know, dear folk, uh, that uh, there are many Roman Catholics that have found their way into translation committees, uh, into the Bible societies, and they today are using the very same text that our uh, Protestant uh, fellows do, uh, and say, we don't need to do any more. I'll just read a couple of statements and we'll close. Uh, the United Bible Society's president, president, by the way, is Roman Catholic Cardinal Anishta of Nigeria. I wonder how he got to that place of prominence. The executive committee includes Roman Catholic Bishop Alamonia of Italy. Among the editors is Roman Catholic Cardinal uh, Martini of Milan. In the past, Roman Catholics would not work with us on Bible translation because we wouldn't use their Vatican. King James didn't have any Catholics on it because of that reason. Uh, and today, uh, we find little by little away from them, well, they're using the same thing we do, so we might as well get in together with them. In fact, they even make that statement, as you'll note from what I read now to you. Notice, uh, Catholics should work together with Protestants in the fundamental task of biblical translation. Uh, they can work very well together and have the same approach and interpretation. This signals a new age in the church. I hate to ever have it said of me that I have the same interpretation of the Bible that a Roman Catholic did and the same approach to the Word of God that a Catholic did. Subsequently, Jesuit scholars moved on to editorial positions in the previously Protestant Journal of Biblical Literature. Their work on the United Bible Society, Nestle's text and influence in biblical scholarship has biased so many new readings that the recent Catholic New American Bible was transmitted directly from the United Bible Society's Nestles rather than the, than the traditional Catholic uh, Latin Vulgate. Now since the, both the Catholic and New Protestant Bibles are now based on the identical critical Greek text, UBS Nestles, which are based on the same 1% minority Greek manuscripts, Vaticanus B primarily, uh, the Catholic doctrinal blend in the NIV and NASB and other new Bibles is substantial, hand in hand, Catholics and unwary Protestants with their Gnostic Vatican manuscript under their arm are being steered into the waiting arms of one church, one world church of the Antichrist. Yeah. Now, two statements in closing. The truth of the matter. A verbatim translation of the Nestle Alam text with all of its deletions would shock even the most liberal reader. And I feel would have real difficulty being sold as a New Testament. The closest actual translation of it are the super-liberal NEV, the TEV, NRSV, the Catholic Bibles, all of which use many of Nestle's Manuscript D readings. Consequently, other versions which are based on Nestle, such as NASB and NIV, borrow, guess where? They borrow from majority or traditional text readings in order to sell their version. Our people wouldn't buy the things if they didn't put some of the old traditional texts back into them. But history proves the Bible believing church always used the traditional text instead of the minority text. May God help us to continue to do so in spite of all of the pressure. And dear folk, there are pressures out there from our brethren, from those in our church fellowships. They think I'm an absolute mother. I go off my rocker. What's happened to Bremen? He never used to ever preach on this sort of thing. Well, I didn't because I didn't know anything about it. Wasn't taught anything about it. And they haven't been taught anything about it. We should not be too hard on them because they were never taught. But I'll tell you, dear friend, we ought to get our heads out of the sand and begin to look at the evidence and take the evidence and believe what we read and what we see and what we can find substantiating our position because we have the greatest amount of that which would substantiate what we believe in. Amen. So I trust we will not fall before the onslaught of the new versions around us today. Remember God has said in his word, 
In Psalms 138, 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for your word. How we praise you for it. Help us, Lord, I pray tonight to uh, vindicate uh, the, the true word of God, which we believe we have in our hands uh, in our traditional version. Father, I pray that you bless uh, the Burgon Society as it continues to do the work of uh, vindicating, supporting, and uh, doing all it can uh, to bring back uh, a proper understanding of your blessed word. Bless the ongoings of the service tonight. Uh, and Dr. Wade, as he proclaims, uh, further the word of God to us in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Let us stand and stand together.